What's up everyone, it's Caddy with Money Vesting. So in this video, we are gonna be talking about the Silicon Valley Bank. And there was a question that was asked earlier in one of my videos. And the comment was, does the bank collapsing here, Silicon Valley Bank going down, change the path for the Federal Reserve policy when it comes to monetary policy with respect to interest rates. So that's exactly what we are going to discuss. I'm also going to summarize what Kathy Wood mentioned in her most recent in the no video on YouTube. So I'm going to summarize a very, very brief, uh, um, you know, monetary policy sort of segment, and then talk a little bit more about the stress test that the Federal Reserve conducts every year. So this time, you know, February 2023, they pretty much released that stress test results last week, or in other words, last month. And uh, I'll break that down and also go over some capital requirements that these banks really have and kind of share my thoughts whether the Federal Reserve's policy will change with what's going on with the Silicon Valley Bank. So hope you guys enjoy this video, find it helpful. If you do, make sure that you drop a like. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel if you're just joining us for the first time. And the link to our Discord and Patreon is gonna be down below if you're interested in joining us. And of course, get access to all the private videos and of course, trade alerts and buy and sell alerts and options alerts, all that stuff. So this right here is gonna be a quick summary here with Silvergate and Silicon Valley Bank going bust here. Kathy Wood believes that the Federal Reserve has gone too far with interest rate hikes. While Silvergate had more concentration on crypto exposure and crypto assets, Silicon Valley Bank had a higher concentration on tech startups and more venture backed firms. But if you look at what happened, it's the deposit outflows, which is forcing these companies to obviously face liquidity squeeze and liquidity issues and explain the entire concept of why that happens in my other video, right? So if you are depositing into a bank, right, the bank pretty much lends that money out, right? They're not holding on to your money, they're lending that money out in order to make those returns, right? Either they're investing it or they're lending it. They're gonna do one of those two things in order to make return on your capital. So once depositors start to start to take money out, right, so once, you know, banks uh, pretty much see the deposits are going out, they're not able to invest that money anymore. And at the same time, they need to have the capital on hand to allow for those withdrawals um, that, the, that the depositors are taking out, right? So the people and the companies that are taking their money out, that's why there's deposits outflowing, they need to have the capital on hand. If they don't, if they've already invested that money in long duration bonds, and mortgage-backed securities, and they are definitely going to be in a bit of a pickle. And that's exactly what happened with Silicon Valley Bank because they had to force sell their entire MBS product, a product portfolio, and of course, take a $1.9 billion bloodbath. In other words, the loss they took. Now, Kathy Wood goes on by saying that there's fewer deals being done and there's a risk aversion in the marketplace. And as these banks pay little to no nothing on deposits, money is fleeing, fleeing to money market funds and higher yield treasuries, which is very, very rational thing to do for investors and for companies because, you know, if banks are not paying you anything, they can go after US treasuries, which are paying you higher yields, and they can part their cash there uh, until they need it, right? The, the, when the maturities happen for those bond yields, they can pretty much take that money out and use it to wherever they see fit. But because of this deposit outflow, there's been a big problem with Silicon Valley Bank. Now, she says this is not going to present difficulty to big banks. They are well capitalized and they don't deal with startups or venture backed firms. They are extremely diversified. And even if they do deal with these firms, it is a very small percentage of their total uh, portfolio and their total business. And since the Lehman moment, big banks have also been heavily regulated and have higher capital requirements thanks to Dodd-Frank Act, which was passed after the great financial crisis. And they do require banks to hold on to some higher capital requirements and obviously be more cognizant of their risk and, and be more vigilant with what they're investing in. Now, regional banks, when it comes to smaller sized banks, more medium sized banks, they don't have those capital requirements. And as a result, they were the ones really getting stuck in this entire mess because since they don't have a lot of capital requirements, they're able to lend out to tech startups and venture backed firms. And as a result, they're the ones struggling right now. I did a video again, previously going over all the banks that you definitely wanna be paying attention to. A lot of them you may not have heard of, I didn't hear of them, but definitely they are struggling at the moment. But this doesn't necessarily mean that all these big banks are clear and you know there's not gonna be any problem. This could still ripple into some of the other big banks as well. And when it comes to the Fed's path, right, monetary policy path, I do strongly believe, in my personal opinion, that the Federal Reserve is pretty much set and done. I think this is still not going to waver their path towards increasing rates moving forward in the rest of 2023. I think they're very much focused on inflation. Yes, this creates this dynamic, this environment where if more and more companies 
actually start to go bust because of their cash pretty much getting wiped out because of Silicon Valley's mistake, or in other words, them going under and the FDIC insurance kind of capped at 250,000, as mentioned in my other video. So customers, if the companies actually started going bust, then yes, unemployment rate could spike, which in turn could spiral the economy into a potential recession, which inherently will reduce the inflation because consumer spending will automatically drop because more and more people are unemployed. They don't really have the money to pay for certain items. So that's kind of like the thought process, which could affect the economy moving forward. But at the same time, the Federal Reserve has already pointed to the idea that they do welcome a softer labor market. And in other words, they are willing to or pretty much allow for the uh, unemployment rate to go higher in order to control inflation and bring it back down. Now, going over to some of the stress tests, and as Jerome Powell's already mentioned in his, uh, you know, testimonies and even in his previous sort of, uh, you know, speeches, that the uh, that the big banks are well capitalized and they do have the liquidity that they need on hand to absorb some of those losses. Now, when it comes to the Federal Reserve, in my opinion, they mostly do care a lot more about the big banks as opposed to the regional banks because the big banks are the big banks, right? I mean, they are the ones that are facilitating, you know, most of the loan activity, the lending activity, most of it goes through the big banks. So we really have to be paying attention to how they are as opposed to how the regional banks are doing and not saying that they are not important, but the Federal Reserve's focus is definitely, in my opinion, more on the bigger banks because they're the ones that are facilitating most of the activity in the financial institution space. Now, when it comes to the February 2023 stress test scenarios, if you come down a little bit, what you'll notice is that a lot of banks actually did not do really well. So if you come down right here, so you can see, and, and what the Federal Reserve does with the stress test scenario is that they basically go over two different scenarios, right? There is a baseline scenario, and then there's an, a severely adverse scenario. And in both of these scenarios, they're pretty much placing a probability, or in other words, a situation, a hypothetical situation, that what if the unemployment rate rises to 6.5% from the starting point, and then in the fourth quarter, 22, and then it peaks at 10% in the third quarter, 2024, there's a sharp decline in economic activity, and also accompanied by an increase in market volatility, widening corporate bond spreads, and collapse in asset prices, including a 38% decline in house prices, and a 40% decline in commercial real estate prices. So we're kind of throwing these curveballs at these banks and kind of creating this hypothetical situation situation to see which banks will actually come out ahead and which ones are actually not going to survive that type of environment. Now, if you take a look at which banks actually did pass and which ones didn't, Bank of America failed on all three ends, right? So subject to global stock market shock, subject to counterparty default, and subject to exploratory market shock, Bank of America hits all three. Bank of New York Mellon pretty much was survived in a subject to global market shock, but the other two, it did fail. If you come down to Citigroup, again, failing on all three ends, we've got Goldman Sachs failing on all three, JP Morgan failing on all three. Now that doesn't necessarily mean that failing is, you know, all of a sudden bad thing. It, it is, I mean, they, they should still be passing this stress test, but what happens is once you fail, your capital requirements go higher, right? If you fail the stress test, you have to be more vigilant. In other words, you have to have higher capital in your bank in order to make sure that if or when that event actually occurs, you are well equipped with the capital requirements. So if you come down, you'll notice that the capital requirements, and this is a CET1 capital requirement, which is like a equity tier, capital equity tier requirement. And it's nothing but your equity and your uh, retained earnings divided by your entire risk-weighted assets. And for and loans are assets for banks, right? So this is the ratio, or this is the percentage that each bank has to hold individually in order to make sure they comply with the Federal Reserve. And as you notice, the Bank of America has a pretty high capital requirement, 10.4%. And that's for a simple reason, because Bank of America did fail on all three ends um, when, when it comes to the scenario analysis. And this right here, again, if you come down the list, you'll notice that Goldman Sachs over here also has a pretty high capital requirement, 13.3%. Then we've got JP Morgan sitting right over here at 12%. Morgan Stanley sitting right over here at 13.3%. Let's see where Morgan Stanley is. Over here, Morgan Stanley also failed on all three accounts when it comes to the stress test. And again, you can kind of go through this list, get the idea. And Bank of America even announced last year, back in June 2022, that they are uh, their comments on the stress test. So Bank of America commented on the results of Federal Reserve's 2022 comprehensive capital analysis and review and announced its plans to increase quarterly common stock. And uh, they also mentioned 
that the CET1 minimum requirement of 9.5% will be higher. This was back in June. Now in 2023, it's even higher at 10.4%. And of course, Jamie Dimon also was not happy with the Fed's stress test, saying that, quote, terrible way to run financial system after his bank hall spyback, right? There's another uh, other things that you have to also comply with. If you don't meet the stress test, if you don't pass it, then you also have to pause uh, buybacks and you know share repurchases and dividends in order to raise that capital requirement, right? In other words, retain that capital back in the firm instead of giving it out to shareholders. You have to retain it back into the company as retained earnings so that your capital increases and that ratio is back in line with what the Federal Reserve wants. Now, that being said, in my opinion, the capital requirements are obviously pretty high, but the comp but the banks are meeting that right now. They are pretty high and they are very much uh, in, in line with what the Federal Reserve wants. So that being said, in my opinion, the Federal Reserve is going to still stick to their path of raising interest rates and how they want to kind of move along with the monetary policy. There is definitely uh, going to be some chaos and some ripple effects of Silicon Valley Bank over to the investors and to the customers, which are actual, um, you know, companies that actually had money with Silicon Valley Bank. And when it comes to other banks, it's going to be more limited or contained to the regional banks, smaller, medium sized banks that also do back venture firms and startups and tech companies. When it comes to larger banks, I personally don't believe it's going to be that much of an issue as much as research that I've done, but it could be considering that a lot of them are not, uh, you know, kind of passing that stress test. So that's a different story. That's something that we can do a video on in more detail. But my thoughts are, I think the Federal Reserve is still going to stay the path. They'll definitely have some comments for us on what's going on, but I think they're going to still stick to the path of raising interest rates, 25 to 50 basis points. Of course, a lot of it rides on the inflation report next week. So hope you guys enjoyed this video, found it helpful. If you did, make sure that you drop a like, subscribe to the channel. As always, happy investing, and I'll see you all in the next video.